March uh, neighborhood meeting, and we want to particularly thank uh, Principal Sparks and Lamar Elementary for hosting us. Um, and uh, he will be our first speaker this evening and give us an update on all the exciting things that are going on at Lamar Elementary. And then we'll be having a continuance of our discussion about um, the um, planning that's going on with SA Tomorrow. Um, it's a follow-up to our last the month's meeting with Garrett Phillips. Um, he's here with us again this evening, but we want to have more of a back-and-forth discussion. Um, and um, um, there we will wrap up with some yeah. brief announcements. And um, also, I want to point out that we have a, a lovely Fiesta wreath that was left over from our garden party, the community garden party, um, from our silent auction. And if any of you would like to bid on the wreath, um, the proceeds will be going to the community garden. Uh, but there is a silent auction sheet. If anyone if you would like to make a bid during the meeting, please feel free to do so. We'll cut off the bidding at 8.30. Uh, but let's go ahead and get start, started with uh, Principal Sparks. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Brian Sparks, principal here at Lamar. It's my fifth year here at the school. Uh, I uh, started my career up in Northeast. I taught special ed in fifth grade up there for a number of years, and I was a math coach in Northeast schools over at Almas Elementary, the early high school. And then I was a Trinity grad, so when the Trinity program moved here to Lamar, it was a big draw for me to come here and work with a program to build out the school in this great community. Uh, this is a really wonderful community, as you all know. But when you're an educator working in a community where there's so many things to learn from and with and people who are willing to help with our school, it's made a big difference just kind of working here relative to other schools that I've been at with the community support. So thank you all. If you've helped in any way to help frame that up for us, we really appreciate it. Um, so tonight I hope to give you sort of a landscape of where the campus is, where it's been, where we're going in the future. Uh, I'll talk for about 10 to 15 minutes and have time for questions at the end. If you have any questions or anything along the way, then feel free to cut me off. I don't like talking for long periods of time, as all my teachers know. Um, so if you want to jump in, feel free to do that um, as we go here. Um, so our campus right now is 352 students. So when I came here, we were at 210 students. Uh, it was on the chopping block for being shut in the next couple of years. So we've really taken mm -hmm. strides to try to build up the enrollment by doing interesting things here at the campus to draw in people to the school, both locally in the neighborhood, but also um, outside of that as well. We serve pre-K through sixth grade students, which is a difference uh, in, the, in the last couple of years. We used to serve only fifth grade uh, from pre-K through fifth grade. The district is making a move more towards absorbing the, the middle school uh, grades into elementary schools, thinking that that would help to retain our enrollment but also help to help those students to be successful when they go to middle school. We see a lot of uh, struggles in middle school kids when they go to sixth, seventh, eighth grade uh, for a lot of different reasons, but trying to keep them on, in a smaller environment has been a big move for the district. Uh, we serve primarily Hispanic students um, and mostly English dominant students at our campus. Uh, we give about a quarter of our students who are Spanish dominant who are in the bilingual program. And we're moving towards a dual language program now where it's in the first year of um, adoption right now in our kindergarten grade level and, and that, that dual language program where we have English and Spanish dominant kids in one room together will then cycle up over the next several years. Uh, and the, and the, both of our enrollment growth has been in pre-K through third grade, so we have about 350 kids who are currently on the waiting list for next year. We'll be able to admit about 50 to 60 of those kids for next year and then we'll still have a lot of kids who want to go to schools like, like ours and also many other schools in our district. Um, and we just don't have room to have them come here because we're space limited here at the school. Um, this is our mission. That, uh, this is our mission that we've worked the last several years to construct. Um, I'm not going to read it to you, but our goal there at the end is really to help kids become advocates for their learning, both locally here at the school in our city, but also in their world. We want them to think big here, even when they're three, four, five, six years old. We want them to think about. Um, how what they're doing in the classroom matters to what we do in our community. So we're trying to kind of connect those dots for them while they're here. Just a little bit on the partnership with Trinity. Uh, I'm a Trinity grad, so I am very biased, but I think the program with Trinity is a wonderful program to help educators become trained in how to teach. 
Um, they really focus a lot on helping their undergraduate and graduate students become advocates for all kids, uh, especially in urban settings. Um, and so we have undergraduate students here going through a number of prep courses. Uh, there's a science class, there's an early childhood class, there's math classes, lots of different exposures for them as they ramp up towards their MAT year, their Master's of Arts in Teaching year. Um, and then many of them come here for their one year internship where they spend a full year interning in one of our classrooms here. We also share that with ALA, the uh, Advanced Learning Academy, where we, ha we have some of the interns here and then they have some of the interns over there. So it's sort of a co-partnership to support the program. And then we have, a lot of, uh, we have a lot of college professors here who are coming through our classrooms to offer us feedback and also offer our younger teachers feedback on their practice. So it's really a great place to learn if you're a young teacher, if you're someone who's new to practice, to get a lot of support from people both who work in the school, but also support systems from outside the school as well. So we are finishing here in the next couple of months our first year as an in-district charter school. Um, so that's not like a KIPP or Great Hearts or public charter school operating outside of the district. We are still part of the district, so we're still part of San Antonio ISD. Um, the reason why we did it is because we were successful already. So a lot of charters go to places that are not successful and then they try to turn them around. We already had a pretty solid record of success. We wanted extra flexibility from our district and from the state. Um, our, district, our, our, our district has a lot of wonderful things about it and there's also some things that's not so wonderful sometimes. So this allows us to get some flexibility away from some of the things that we wanted to kind of opt out of. So in the charter you have to outline a number of things that you want exemptions from. We have 13 exemptions in our charter, all the way from staffing to curriculum to how we spend our money uh, that we had to ask for. Those are built into every school. And then it also got us some extra money from the district and then from the state. So we have $800,000 to spend for this year plus next year on technology, uh, staff development, um, extra hours for staffing, for furniture, so all sorts of things to help get us started. And then we also have a quarter million dollars every single year to pay for extra days for our staff and then also for staff development on a continuing basis. Uh, and we wouldn't have gotten those resources without filing our charter. And then we had to kind of make a case to the school board to justify why we're doing it, how we're doing it. And then we'll need to go back every year to reaffirm the charter and then every five years to formally refile the charter if there needs to be any amendments or if we're not successful over time. So on your table, you have a handout that looks like this. This is very small. I know you probably can't see it. So on the handout, this just sort of outlines in a snapshot view what we're about here. Um, we had a number of meetings. Some of you were at those meetings a number of years ago um, to vision out where we're going as a campus and what our hopes and dreams are for our kids. And the middle five pillars right there that go vertically are our five primary focuses while we're here in our building. And the, the, the bottom five, um, the uh, base of the structure, are the actual tangible things that are happening in the building that anchor to those goals. Uh, we want kids, just for the goals, to, to be curious kids and learners. Uh, a lot of um, kids lose that over time, especially third, fourth, fifth grade when we start testing and uh, they don't enjoy coming to school anymore. It happens in a lot of schools. We want to maintain a sense of curiosity and wonder in their work. A lot of pre-K kids have it. Almost all of them do. And you sort of see it slowly wane over time. So we're trying to be intentional about how we maintain a sense of curiosity uh, in our building. We, um, with our dual language program, we are launching that this year. So we're trying to merge populations together rather than have two tracks of kids that go along through our school, either an English dominant or a bilingual track. One of our classes will merge those populations together starting this year and then over time. Um, and that also has residual effects for the rest of the campus and how we build out activities that we do and how we involve parents. Um, we have an emotional intelligence component. Our, our kids are stressed out, um, much more so than they were when I started my career. They're hearing a lot of things that we just weren't exposed to growing up from the news, from their parents, from watching TV, watching movies sitting there on their iPods, like lots of sources are flooding them with information and it's stressing a lot of them out. And you can see it in how they handle challenges here at school. So we try to, to take steps to intentionally teach kids skills and strategies to work through challenges, knowing that they're gonna come here with them. We can't filter out all those things on the outside of school, but we can't handle them while we're here. 
Uh, we are working really hard to develop a sense of collaboration in the building as well. We want kids to look to, to know how to work together. Whenever we look for, for teachers to, to interview, one of our interviewing components is to do a group uh, interview protocol where <coughs> you give them a task and they have to work together. And, and then we also have an individual interview task as well. And a lot of the people who can do the individual interview and answer questions that they probably memorize out of the book or, or you know, uh, have kind of been trained on, they don't have the soft skills and the, and the, the uh, interpersonal skills to know how to work with one another. And we want to teach kids that when they're really young here at school. And then we want to teach kids to be advocates. Uh, we want them to know that they have control over what they're doing. Um, and that they have some power, uh, and learning comes with power. Um, just a couple of more tangible pieces that are happening. We have a longer school year here, um, so it's, uh, we, we know that kids, when they have 11 or 12 weeks off during summer, um, even as a really active kid who was involved in a lot of things, I still sat around and watched Wimbledon, and watched the real world, and watched all sorts of stuff that I been watching on TV, and I was at home by myself a lot, and I had, I had great parents, you know, like, so, so and really involve parents. So a lot of our kids don't have the level of support that many of us grew up in. We want to try to shorten the summer down so we can keep them busier during the summer, but also spread out those breaks during the year so they can stay fresher during the course of the year. Our, our, uh, our um, staff is also enjoying those breaks during the year too. So they've gone on lots of trips this year at off, at off travel times, which has been great for them. But it's also <laughs> helped them to keep them fresh uh, when they come back to work. Uh, teaching is really, arduous and it can wear you out very easily and um, we want to keep them fresh so we don't have burnout here at the school. Um, we do have this, we have five more school days here than the rest of the school district because of the charter and then every school day here is 30 minutes longer than other schools in the district as well because of the charter as well. And our teachers are then compensated for that so we can then compete with other campuses around our district by then paying them a little bit more money which has been a great thing for our staff. Um, I already sort of hit on these points about the emotional intelligence piece, but every single morning, every kid is in a thing called Tiger Time, um, where they spend time connecting with, with, with one another, they're sharing something about their lives. Um, it's given our teachers a lot of input that they wouldn't otherwise have had access to from our kids' lives. Uh, it provides us a, spe a specified amount of time to teach specific um, uh, social emotional strategies that we've learned through a variety of, of um, inputs and it's been a great way to start the day. A lot of schools start with um, intervention where you walk in the door and you're said go to a reading group or go to a math group where you're struggling. It's a really hard way to start the day so we're trying to flip that a little bit and have a softer entry into our school day. So this is just a snapshot of what we're doing during that in the morning time is, is trying to help kids identify what they're feeling and then working towards a, uh, helping them regulate their emotions over time. And so it's interesting to hear the language that pre-K, kinder, and first grade kids have about what they're feeling and how that shifts over time as they go towards fourth to sixth grade. Uh, and as we've taught more of these tools, it's helped kids to both understand what they're feeling and then know what to do with it. Um, it's been pretty cool to see them over the span of a year just to see how much they've grown. The biggest curriculum component to our campus is project-based learning, um, and that houses kids thinking about real problems that are facing their lives locally here at the school, in our city, in our community, or possibly in a wider lens. So our kids have done all sorts of things in the last year plus to think about um, how we can meet the state standards, but also how we can do it in a really authentic way, um, which is not how I learned as a kid growing up. When I think about what was authentic about my learning experiences, I think of one or two experiences in high school, but almost nothing in elementary or middle school. Uh, there was a lot of stuff that, I mean, I was a good student, so I learned, but there were a lot of kids who were struggling, who weren't learning, who weren't really engaged in what they were doing. Uh, what they were doing. So this is an example of last year, we did a voting project where uh, kids got to actually register. They, they were, they were, there was a registrar who came here to school to help families register to vote. They were grandmothers who were registering for the first time in their entire lives to vote here, and kids got to be a part of that process. Kids did promotional videos to try to get out the vote for our community as well. Um, and so instead of doing like a, I'm gonna go vote for this president or that president, which all schools were doing, we tried to have kids read a lot about 
what our voter turnout was, and they were incredibly dismayed to hear what our voter turnout was in Texas. Uh, and you know, it's likely been up a little bit, which they were watching, but uh, it's frustrating for them to realize that. And, uh, and I didn't actually know how low it was until the kids started to research it. Um, we've done a number of other things. Our garden in front is tied to PBL projects where the kids had to measure out, think about the, the, uh, the actual cubic uh, capacity of how much dirt to put in the garden, what plants would do well there. It all ties into standards. Uh, there's a lot of reading involved, a lot of research involved, which it does in a really meaningful way for kids. It, the biggest drawback is that it's a heavy teacher load to write a lot of curriculum. Um, so you have to find people who are incredibly talented to write curriculum and make it customized on student interests. Uh, I mentioned our dual language program. Um, the kids who are in the dual language program in kindergarten will receive 80% of their instruction in Spanish, 20% in English regardless of your, of your language of, of, uh, of your home language. So we have English dominant kids in our kindergarten classroom who are, who are learning 80% of their day in Spanish. And you can start to hear them over the course of the year refer to all sorts of things in Spanish. Like you can see them sort of migrate over towards speaking a lot of Spanish, even when they're five years old. Um, and to see the kids interact with each other has been really cool because before they were separate, and now they're having conversations together and playing together. It's been a great thing for the campus so far. I want to give you sort of a snapshot of some pictures, give you sort of the essence of what's happening. Here's the, uh, the eclipse here where they're looking at. We got some eclipse classes from one of our from one of our parents. Here's the voting event. There's one of our students presenting at SAMA where he got to see his work up on the big SAMA display wall at the Museum of Art, uh, where every kid goes, every grade level, every kid goes every single year. And then there's somebody who's actually a parent of ours now who comes to pre-teach a lesson so the kids have some access to the content that they're about to be exposed to at the museum. And then there's also a follow-up lesson as well with the kids. This is our bee project where the kids have to learn all about pollinators and why they're so important to our world and how we wouldn't have many good things to eat uh, that are fresh if we didn't have pollinators. And kids had no idea, a lot of our teachers had no idea about how important bees were. Um, so really it's educating our kids, but it's also educating us about things that really matter to our world. Uh, we had Earth Day a couple of weekends ago, and it was a great turnout. We had a lot of families who took part in it, um, and we planted a bunch of fruit trees. Um, it's also tied to a PBL unit. Uh, our staff is wonderful, and you won't find anybody harder working than our teachers and our, and our staff here. Um, this is Andrea Lucas, who won our Regional Teacher of the Year, and then she was a top three finalist for the State Teacher of the Year. She's incredible, and she's one of many people who are worthy of that award. Every year we go to Trinity to do a lot of learning that's off-site, kind of gives us a break from the building here and um, gives us some really good food from Trinity. Um, yeah, so uh, I know it's fast and furious. Any of you are welcome to come any day to come visit the campus, visit classrooms, um, to volunteer with kids, mentor kids, just hang out with them at recess and laugh a little bit. If you want to smile, go to a pre-K class and just hang out there for a little bit and be a lot of fun because uh, they have a lot of fun. Are there any questions uh, about the campus or about sort of future directions here as we work away here? Yes, I, I came in a little late. Have you talked about the, uh, the board report information They've been about the San Antonio the School District funding? Yeah. Do you anticipate losing any teachers? So we won't lose teachers here. Our enrollment's going up. Um, we won't lose people here. And that, was, that was part of the goal in the charter too, is seeing our enrollment, seeing the, the rents and, and, um, and house prices in the area. We knew we would lose some kids over time, so it was a way for us to keep the enrollment. Uh, I don't anticipate losing teachers here. Um, we, should, we should actually gain a couple. We're going to gain one in six. Um, maybe gain one somewhere else. Not sure yet. Uh, so our enrollment's going up, and we're not going to lose. Now, what will, what will happen is that somebody else will lose. And they'll need to move people off their campus, and if we have openings, then we might absorb them into our campus, uh, which is good and bad depending on who the person is. Yeah. There are other questions. Um, when, uh, as I recall, when we first started talking about becoming a charter here, there was some discussion of becoming a pre-K through eight. Is that going to happen? So I think we'll know more next year about if it'll go through eighth grade. If it does, it will require either moving pre-K through first off campus and having a satellite campus somewhere else, 
or moving six through eighth off campus and having the satellite campus there, all under the same umbrella, um, same same mission, same vision, but just two separate physical spaces. Unless they were to build a third floor here, which would be five to eight years off and lots of money. So there could be a band aid solution to keep it all under the same same goals, but. Uh, it's likely, and it's also dependent upon how much our, our families want it to. I know a lot of them are interested. So um, there, are, there, are, there are definite pros and cons for us here at the campus level, but if the community really wants it, then uh, I hope that they'll speak to the school board and, and my supervisor and sort of share those concerns and questions with them. But I, I, if I had to guess right now, I would say it's like 51, 49, yes. But the more people who speak up, uh, the better. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I can pay late, but I, what is the name of the charter? Are you so under one of So it's still Lamar Elementary. No? Yeah, it's still Lamar Elementary. No, we, correct, but who, who's under, who's funding this? So the I mean, state of Texas. Who's the charter? So, so TEA, Texas, the Texas Education Agency, um, has grants that are set aside for innovative schools to apply I see. for grants. So it's not under like, some of these charter schools. No. Up, and then our district, it? using their regular budget, uh, Provided us that money to help to about you know two hundred forty thousand dollars to help pay okay. on an annual basis for the campus, okay. and so we have to prove that that's working through enrollment, through results, right. through yeah. family satisfaction. I think it's worth mentioning that sixth graders just added this year, correct? Uh, last year. Last year, okay. Last year. So we were only um, was it kinder through fifth. Pre K through fifth before that. And then we added yeah. some additional pre K classes to help build enrollment. We added a sixth grade class too, which is great. There's also an agreement, I think this is going back, that all of our students can go directly to Junior High at Hawthorne so that they can stay together. Um, if there's not a good solution on this campus, when some of the other ones age out. So it's a, it's a nice temporary setup for our neighborhood children. Yes, ma'am. So you were talking about the Spanish, and I was wondering, you said, 80% uh, Spanish, 20% English. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and that goes to what grade? So in kindergarten, it's 80-20. First grade, same thing, 80-20, and there's specified subjects that, that, that are then taught in Spanish or English. Uh, second grade, it goes to 70-30. Third grade, 60-40, and then fourth grade, it flattens out at 50-50. So it wouldn't go over 50-50 either way once you go from fourth through sixth grade, which is different than our current model. Okay, so you don't have Spanish immersion? No, we don't. Spanish immersion is typically where you're in Spanish 100% um, of the time, and typically you're around English dominant peers where everyone speaks English, but they're just sort of dumped into a Spanish classroom. There's a lot of great things about that model. The biggest drawback is that you don't have Spanish dominant peers to then build off of, and they don't have you to build off of as well. And that um, in most Spanish immersion programs, it's, it's, it's mostly um, uh, English dominant students. And it can be done different ways, but but our district is doing a dual language model where it's it's evenly Spanish and then English dominant students in the classroom. So that's district wide, district wide standard. Every campus where they have enough Spanish dominant students, they are trying to do a dual language model where it's evenly split. The issue is that certain communities have fewer Spanish dominant students. Uh, certain communities that that are more rare have not enough English dominant students who want to go to the school. Um, Possibly because of the area it's in, to then build up the to, uh, to make it 50-50. But the goal is to get a, is to get an 